My name is Jay Shamba. I'm the director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, here at George Washington University. Uh, we're very pleased here at IAP to be hosting this event on the US Federal Reserve and Economic Inequality, an installment in our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series, a series where we investigate important topics from a range of viewpoints. For those of you who don't know us, IAP is located at the Elliott School at GW and is a cross-school interdisciplinary research center at GW. We aim to serve as a catalyst for high quality inter interdisciplinary research on policy issues surrounding economic globalization um, from a broad viewpoint on that. Uh, we interpret that mandate rather widely. We support research and policy work on areas ranging from trade to international finance to development to poverty studies to climate change and economic policy more broadly. IEP has been hosting a, a number of series virtually during the pandemic on inequality, on China, on India, on trade policy, and this Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series. Um, please take a look at our website um, where you can see more details on upcoming events and our YouTube channel where you can find prior events as well. On February 2nd, we'll have a book talk um, from Ajay Chibber's new book, uh, and that talk will include our dean, it'll include Martin Wolf, Kaushikasu, so please take a look at the upcoming events tab um, and join us there. So without further ado, um, welcome virtually to Washington, D.C., to George Washington University, and now I'll turn it over to Sunil Sharma, who's a distinguished visiting scholar at the Institute for International Economic Policy and the co-organizer of this series. He'll introduce the series, the event, and our speakers. Sunil. Uh, great. Thanks, uh, Jay, very much. Let me add my welcome uh, to everybody. Today, we have the 11th seminar in the series on rethinking capitalism and democracy. The series focuses on systemic issues. Today's topic is the US Federal Reserve and economic inequality. The Federal Reserve is in many ways an institution whose policies have system-wide effects. It sets short-term policy rates that influence the term structure of rates available to financial, government, and household sectors. It engages in the design and uh, operation of regulatory policy that influences the structure and operation of financial intermediaries and markets. To address today's topic, we have a stellar cast. Um, I'm not going to um, read out their bios. Those were circulated to you. But today, really, we do have a stellar cast. Karen Petro, the managing partner of Federal Financial At Analytics, one of the keenest observers of the Fed is our main speaker. Her excellent book, Engine of Inequality, took the Fed to task for exacerbating income and wealth inequality in the last decade or so. Along with Karen, we have a set of equally distinguished discussants who I will introduce very quickly and very briefly. Mark Livonian, who until recently was a managing director um, at the Promontory Group, and before that was a senior deputy controller at the OCC, and Vice President for Banking Supervision and Regulation at the San Francisco Fed. Bill Nelson, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of the Bank Policy Institute um, and held senior positions at the Federal Reserve Board, including Deputy Director of the Division of Monetary Affairs. And last but not least, Peter Conti Brown, Professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, a financial historian and legal scholar who's written extensively on central banking, financial regulation and public finance, with a particular focus on Fed history. He is the author of the book, The Power and Independence of the Federal Reserve, Princeton 2016, and the co-author of a leading textbook on financial regulation. Okay, with that, uh, Karen, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Sunil, and it is a great pleasure to be here today to, to uh, be, participate in the distinguished work of the IIEP with so many colleagues for whom I have so much uh, respect. I would like today to talk about not just the Fed's role in economic inequality, but the future of economic inequality in the monetary and regulatory context established by the Fed's policies since 2008. Starting off though, I think it is important and maybe salutary, certainly shocking to take a look at American economic inequality. And if I could have the first slide, please, you'll see that from just 2020 to the most recent data in the third quarter of 2021, we've seen a stunning increase in wealth inequality. 
with the top 1% share now is totaling well over $43 trillion. And that's a really seriously large amount of money for a relatively small number of people. Many, the most other Americans, their wealth did go up, went up 73%, which is a stunning amount, but their share is tiny, measly. 1.8%. And the amount of money shared among that group is, of course, negligible on a per household or per individual basis. You'll see in slide two, the income data are at least as distressing. The top 1%, 43 times the income of the middle 40%, I'm sorry, bottom 50%, as I recall that slide. And the amounts involved are, again, stunning. This is labor and capital income, but it really doesn't matter. It's the money the household or the individual has, and the disparities are profound. When you think about this, it obviously has st stunning and structural economic impact. The marginal propensity to consume has changed over the years. How whole households get by has changed over the years. The amount of debt households have has increased. The um, bottom 50% of the United States now has 166% more, more debt than durable assets. If these are, and that's an astonishing ratio, 166%, $166 of debt for every dollar of durable assets. And when you look at the data, from a household's perspective, they're even more distressing. In the most recent Census Bureau data, comparing how households felt about their economic well being from January of 2021 till the end of last year, the end of the fourth quarter, 50% of American households said they didn't think they could manage their debt. 37% of American households said they couldn't handle an economic a, a surprise, a financial surprise, a blown tire of more than $100 without struggling. And perhaps when you put the income data into context, it's interesting to note that Americans believe that they needed an income of $128,000 to have economic security and be able to result, um, respond to shocks and prepare for the future we know something is profoundly wrong. How much of this, the real question is why, and how much of this is the fault of economic, of, of the policies, monetary and finance and regulatory that the Federal Reserve has adopted since particularly 2010. I think we importantly put the context of the Fed's unconventional policy and its enormous uh, changes in interest rates, its portfolio and market support in one context in 2008, and immediately after a shock, the same thing in March of 2020. But the question is, after 20, 2008, those policies stayed largely in place and unchanged until 2020. And now, of course, we have still more enormously accommodative policy combined with still greater market backstops. These have structural impact, and I'm going to try to show quickly some of the key points in my book about why the Fed has a key role in them, and most importantly, why we need to change. Even if the Fed has only a small role in economic inequality, economic inequality in the United States is the worst in any advanced economy, a terrible burden to households. And as I think we've all seen over the last few years, a truly corrosive force in American politics. So even a little change is a lot of contribution to an urgent problem. Yeah. The Fed strongly denies there any role that it might have in economic inequality. Jay Powell has been questioned a good deal about my book, both in Congress and in other forums. And he has two key replies. One, we didn't do it. And two, even if we did, fiscal policy is responsible for economic inequality, not us. And it's whatever we might have inadvertently and 
unfortunately have done in the course of pure monetary policy, fiscal policy must do what it can to clean up. And what I'd like to do today is address each one of these points, uh, try to show that the Fed has a significant role and that fiscal policy now is so overpowered by monetary policy that even if it should clean it up, which I don't think, I think monetary policy and fiscal financial policy should be at least mindful of economic inequality and do as little harm as possible. But even if fiscal policy could clean it up, it no longer can. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about what our current inflationary environment means to economic inequality and the structure of growth going forward. We'll hear a lot about that this afternoon after um, President, um, Chairman Powell's press conference. I think this is such a critical issue. I wanted to be sure to bring that before all of you as well. Very briefly, as Sunil said, I call my book Engine of Inequality. Not because I think the Fed is the sole engine of inequality, very, not at all, but something happened in 2010 and Theodore, if we could have slide three, I think you'll see a stunning shift in American economic inequality from both income and wealth perspectives in 2020 and 2010 and thereafter. Now, what are the, the causes of economic inequality other than monetary and regulatory policy? Demographics, yes. My book goes through each one of these. Globalization, yes miserable public education, yes. Uh, several other factors, especially regressive to fiscal policy, yes. Did they all change that much, that fast in 2010? A single variable that really changed in, 20, in that year was the Fed's determination to continue ultra accommodative monetary policy. And it did so throughout the subsequent decade, which despite that policy was the weakest one in terms of a recovery since the Second World War. Now, why might that have been? Again, it's certainly not on purpose, but I think it's a lot more than correlation. I think there are key causal effects in monetary and regulatory policy. Briefly, they are the Fed's enormous portfolio, now a third of GDP, which distorts how markets work. Of course, it has to. The scarcity of safe assets, the shift in yield chasing, the very and the alterations this has made in the way banks engage in financial intermediation to profoundly altered the way money flows through the economy and the extent to which it ends up in the forms of output generating capital formation. That would be a sig significant impact of quantitative easing and uh, alone. I mean, it was the Fed did it because they expected the flood of liquidity not only to stabilize markets as it did, but also to generate enormous amounts of bank lending, which it didn't. Ultra low interest rates had a huge impact on that. I talk in my book, and it's really important to remember that banks are profit making institutions. The combination of the rules they operated under 2010 and the and slow recovery combined with ultra low rates make it very difficult for banks to make money in traditional financial intermediation. They changed their business models. It became much more fee-based institutions, trading, corporate lenders, very different business model than what one thinks about what the Fed's monetary policy theories assume banks do as intermediators and transmitters of monetary policy. And ultra low rates also did something profound. They destroyed the ability of average households to save. Now, I've been told a lot, well, yes, but they could have invested in the markets. Look how well the markets did. But the top 1% of Americans hold 55% of financial assets in this country. The top 10% holds 88% of financial assets. Most American households have very small amounts of stocks and bonds. And interestingly, the home, supposedly the, the foundational element of wealth accumulation increasingly is no longer serving that purpose for all but the upper middle class. A lot of data on this, some in my book, more coming out every day. And finally, the third 
turbine in the engine of inequality is the Fed's backstop for markets. The Greenspan put that's become the Powell put. Markets revved up by ultra low rates by the Fed's portfolio have gone up and up and become ever more divorced from market fundamentals and macroeconomic reality. And that creates its own reality, which because of who owns assets and how most American households live paycheck to paycheck has had a terrific impact on economic inequality as well as on financial instability. I think we have seen a significant and structural change that the Fed may begin to, to taper, to tighten today, but the structure of the economy, the structure of our inequality and the way money, how could the Fed not have an impact on economic inequality? It is the sole arbiter of monetary policy and at the scale and scope and force it is, it is a tremendous powerful influence on who has money, who spends money and where that money moves to generate what kind of output. It's important to note, you know, the Bank for International Settlements look at only at quantitative easing going back to 2017, let alone now found that quantitative easing, the third one, not all of it, but Q, QE3, had 10 times more benefit for equity prices than it did for output. Let me turn quickly to fiscal policy. Could fiscal policy clean this up? I don't think it can. And I don't, I, I just last fall wrote a paper on this, um, which you can find on my firm's website um, and a couple of other places. So on, on that interplay between fiscal and monetary policy, I think just today I'd only say that we're seeing what's happening. You would think, we would have thought in 2010, we would have had an enormous spurt of growth because we had the very, um, one of the largest this infrastructure fiscal policy stimuli in 2009, and it petered out. We had tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus in 2020 and 2021. And that is not showing up. We've since growth spurts, but we're still well behind trend. And in terms of who is enjoying the fruits of this recovery, I think it is not low, moderate, and middle-income households. Yes, wages are up, but on real you know, inflation-adjusted terms, they're not. And most households, as I said, are living paycheck to paycheck with debt. 50% of the population's is debt they can barely manage and no savings to speak of for down payments or retirement. I fear, therefore, that continued fiscal policy will have just additional inflationary effects combining with those, unfortunately, from su supply chain problems and the current uh, money, su money supply. Now, what will inflation mean? I, I, I think we're, uh, one of the things I wanted to bring out today is I, I fear we're all looking too much at Paul Volcker and what happened in the 1980s and what the Fed did then as the model for what will happen now. And if you can bring slide four up, Theodora, you'll see that there's this very critical difference because of the way the Fed in the 80s sent interest rates. Rates even through the worst of the inflation fighting were positive in real terms. Now, even before we head into an anti-inflationary effort by the Fed, they're negative in real terms. If you're a saver right now in a bank, you savings cost you 6.9% in real terms. Saving rates are six basis points, inflation is seven, and you're out a lot of money. Now, what does that mean? America in the 1980s was much more equal. We had a middle class with more sources, with better savings, more stable employment, and wages that remained largely real in terms of even on inflation, despite the enormous amount of inflation at, at, in the late eighties. So we had a very different economy with a robust middle class, one that is now, as everyone says, hollowed out. So I really fear that what we're going to see, the combination of monetary policy, 
or regulatory policy and all the changes it's made in the way banks transmit monetary policy and fulfill their macroeconomic function of financial intermediation have combined to lead to acute forces of disintermediation. We have a lot more financial market participants, big techs, fintechs, money market funds, major players who largely didn't exist in the 1980s, playing a very different role in the market. And it's hard for me to see how with this new burst in inflation, even if it comes down, even if we start to see supply chain stabilization, it will leave in its wake prices that will take years to, to go down should they go down at all making the families farther and farther behind, not just from a share of income and wealth perspective, but really also from the prospects of family economic security. What to do about that? Obviously, this is a, a grievous problem, and I think one that may well get still worse. In my book, I have a, a number of solutions um, both to regulatory policy challenges and to monetary policy. From the monetary policy perspective, I just urge rapid normalization so that the Fed's brought together, it's have its cake and eat it too. We had robust growth, but we need ultra accommodative policy. Well, you know, why, how can you have them both at the same time? If the growth is so robust, adjust the policy for a slower, um, return to a much more normal market in which the market, not the Fed, calls all the shots. I fear at this point we may be beyond that because inflation is so out from under the Fed and inequality is so acute and the economy is already showing signs of severe stress. So two solutions. One simple, oh, I think, more something many of you will love more than the public will understand, but I think the Fed keeps talking about its policies are data driven, but it's really making policies on very bad data because it continues to rely for the most part on it, not entirely. When you look at the FOMC dots, um, they're all rep almost all representative agent data. And with a hollowed out middle class, that really does not describe America as it is. And it leads to very bad calls about how employment is maximum. We're not looking at wages. We're just looking at jobs. We're not looking at marginal propensity to consume for output producing goods. We're looking at indices. I've gone through a lot of them in my book that I think mislead policymakers into a false sense of security that America doesn't share. You can tell that again by how America votes, what America says, what it, what it feels about its own financial security, which drives its behavior. The Fed looks at a lot of market-based indices. I think it needs to really look at representative agent indicators and listen to what the public says its expectations are for the future and how that drives household economic behavior. In an economy based on consumption, what consumers say really warrants attention. But as I said, I, I fear that even if the Fed were determined now to do the kind of structural change, normalization may be very difficult to pull off without severe stress. And I'm thinking through adopting the concept of automatic stabilizers to, mon um, to monetary policy, as well as the discussion the Treasury Department and Congress is having about fiscal policy automatic stabilizers. You think about these as sort of a tailor rule for market interventions, a set of indicators in which the Fed would intervene by support, not just to financial markets, there would be some, but also through the regulated financial system into households, small businesses, and key engines of employment and financial security. I proposed one of them in 2020, I call it family financial facility. I think there are a lot of other ways to think about this, but I really would like to urge and I look forward to discussing these with the discussants and all of you. I think we need to step back and say, what 
led the Fed in 2020, I think this is, is more a moral question than a macroeconomic one, but why did the Fed think junk ETFs were warrant, warranted hundreds of billions of dollars of support and not households that when COVID struck, lost their jobs and suddenly faced huge bank overdrafts and struggling with credit card bills they thought they could no longer repay. Households had acute liquidity problems too. And they're the ones that lead the structural damage. More you, we support junk ETFs and other key sectors of the high yield risk-taking financial economy at the expense of American households. What's left of our middle class, I think the more danger we run of still worse monetary policy transmission, a still more fragile financial system and a still angry public. Thanks very much. I really look forward to the discussion and then to questions. Uh, Karen, thank you very much. Um, with that, um, let me invite uh, Mark Livonian uh, to provide his comments, um, and then we'll follow it up with, uh, with Bill Nelson and then uh, Peter. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, just to confirm, <laughs> Sunil, that you can hear me and you can see my slides on the screen. Yes, we can. We can see the slides and we can hear you. Super. Okay. Uh, well, good. Well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. And thanks to GW and the, um, the Institute and Sunil and Jay and their colleagues for putting all this together. Uh, and for Karen, uh, uh, you know, the book that she wrote that a lot of her remarks are, are drawn from, uh, I, I've read it. It's a good read. Um, I recommend if you have it, if you don't have it, go out and buy it and read it. Um, she covered a lot of ground today, and there's no way in a 10-minute discussion that I can really do it full justice. Um, so I figure the role of a discussant can be to try to toss out a, a few ideas and reactions and stimulate good discussion, hopefully. And, and I also know from experience that in, an, uh, in 10 minutes, I can probably do at most three plant three ideas. So I thought I'd start by saying what I'm, what I'm going to do as my three. Um, as I hope you can see on the screen. Um, I, I think recent monetary policy has had some unintended consequences and some of them have been pretty bad. Um, uh, that, and I'm a little bit, maybe a little on shaky ground here because uh, even though I was at the Fed for a long time, I was on the banking and regulatory side, not directly in monetary policy. So, uh, you know, have to qualify my thoughts a little bit there. Um, second, I wanna suggest that inequality in itself is maybe not the key problem to focus on, it might be more distracting. And here I'm, I'm definitely on even shakier grounds because inequality is not something that I've done research in, it's not something I've really addressed. So I'm gonna throw out some thoughts and if I'm full of it, people can tell me, I'm happy to hear that. Um, and then third, uh, I really can't address all of the policy suggestions that Karen makes, but I wanna focus on one which is you know, is a, a return to kind of bank-led intermediation is that part of the solution? And I'm going to suggest that I, I don't think it is. Um, so let me let me start with the first one of these, which is uh, monetary policy. Um, I put a chart up here now that shows the um, sh how the Fed's portfolio of debt securities has evolved over the past 20 years. Um, so it's a graph that it shows that the Fed's holdings of securities as a percentage of of everything out there in the US uh, financial and non-financial issuance um, was about 4% of that before the financial crisis. And then it, it kind of doubled right after the crisis and then continued on its way up for a few years, tapered off a little bit, but with COVID has gone up again. And so now it's approaching 20% of, of the market. Um, so it's, the Fed's a much bigger part of US financial markets than it has been historically. I, there's no surprise, but I, I think this chart helps put in context how, how big and dramatic that is. And it, there are different reasons for how we got here. Um, and we can debate what, how effective this has been at, even at meeting the Fed's stated policy objectives. And I'm sure everyone has a view. Um, importantly, it has coincided with a run up, a significant run up in the prices of financial assets. And as Karen, um, you know, would point out that that's been great for anybody who is holding their wealth in financial assets during this time that, the, you know, the rich got richer. Um, my concern about this trend is actually a little different, uh, just to suggest. Um, my income. I need. Uh, I'm sorry, was that Sunil? 
Okay, um, so concern about this is a little different that um, the, uh, I think the Fed has a legitimate concern, financial stability concerns about um, having well-functioning financial markets. Uh, but in my view, that primarily should be to address temporary market dislocations and illiquidity, not to have the Fed serving as a significant provider of, of longer-term credit. And, and I think this picture shows a central bank that's shifting from being a source of liquidity to being a source of credit. It's becoming more the, you know, providing the gasoline for the engine instead of the grease for the gears. And I think the problem with this is it, there's, a, there's a slippery slope element to it. If the Fed's providing all of this credit to the markets, um, then why can't it do other types of credit provision? What's to stop it? Why, why shouldn't it be involved in infrastructure finance? Why shouldn't it lend to small businesses or low-income families? Um, I think Karen was suggesting some of that sort of at, at the end, and maybe we'll get back to that. Um, it's, it gets harder and harder for the Fed to credibly argue that it's not already involved in credit extension when its portfolio looks like this. Uh, and so, uh, if, if it can't credibly argue that it's just providing liquidity to ensure orderly markets, then you have to draw a line somewhere who gets to draw that line and where. Um, personally, I think having the central bank this involved in credit extension in the economy is bad uh, for efficient allocation of credit and ultimately harmful to the financial system and the economy. But putting that aside, I think it's also importantly, um, it, it moves the Fed even farther toward becoming a fiscal agent uh, for the government and to be a, a fiscal policy uh, function. And once that goes far enough, it's gonna be very hard for the Fed to remain outside of the political processes that, um, that should determine fiscal policy. So the Fed would lose its political independence, which personally I think would be bad for policy. If you think monetary policy is bad now, wait till you see politically driven monetary policy. So. I'm concerned about this. I think policy has been, been bad. I think it's led to a bad place. And I think there's some danger in this. Uh, let me turn now to inequality. Um, and I put up here on the screen a few statements about inequality. Um, one is that I think some inequality is, is natural, necessary, and probably good. Uh, what do I mean by that? I think the natural part, for example, their life cycle. Life cycle affects the wealth. So people are going to start out, they're going to get richer through their lives and you know this everybody's not going to be equal all the time that's maybe an obvious point uh, but also some inequality is driven by rewards coming to productive activity to creativity um, to risk taking to innovation and those are things that we need and we need the incentives for those and the opportunity to acquire wealth even outsized wealth is part of what drives people to do that and I think we're, we're better off with it than without it so we have to like in my view accept that there will be some inequality. Um, and I think probably, probably everybody would agree with that, but probably also agree that too much inequality is bad. Um, Karen, I think touched on some of that. I, the one, one of the ones I find most compelling is the political divisiveness that goes with people perceiving that the distribution is unfair. Um, Karen described that just in her remarks just now as, as corrosive. And, and I think that's a fair description. But so like as an economist, and I think, all right, so, so some inequality is good, but too much is bad. That means there's a trade-off, marginal this versus marginal that. And where is the where do you set the trade-off? And I, I feel like I don't know enough, maybe other people do on this, to know how much inequality should we be aiming for. You could say, well, it doesn't matter. Let's just start in the direction of making it more equal because clearly it's too unequal now. And I somewhat support that, but I've been in policymaking situations where we started out without a clear sense of what the target was. We had direction, but not what the ultimate aim was. And it usually didn't end well. So I think it's better to know what you're aiming for before you set out in a policy direction. Um, more importantly though, I wanna question whether inequality is the right focus and maybe just more of a distraction from the real root issues. Because when I think about a lot of the problems that Karen was describing, economic, social, and so on, I don't see most of them as stemming from inequality. Um, take the now famous, the kinds of survey results about whether people could tolerate um, an unexpected expense. So like 40% of adults uh, would have struggled to cover an unexpected $400 expense. Um, and do a thought experiment. Suppose you took um, 
uh, Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and whoever else you want to put in there and took away all of their wealth and put in a big hole in the ground and covered it up with dirt, would inequality have been addressed, improved? I mean, yes, the distribution of wealth would be more equal now. Would those people be able to pay those $400 expenses any more easily? No, because they didn't get that well. So, but the point is, it's not the inequality per se that's the problem. It's that there are people who are living on the edge and are vulnerable because of that. It's an issue. It's that they're poor. It's that there's poverty. It's not a relative question about who has more. It's an absolute question about whether people have enough. Um, and I will say just as a matter of personal opinion, I think we're a wealthy enough society, a rich enough society that nobody should be poor. We probably need a more aggressive system of transfers. But the issue isn't the inequality. So in my view, uh, the, the absolute matters, uh, matters more than the relative. And maybe just to illustrate that even a little further, let me put up another slide here. Um, one of the statements Karen, one thing Karen points out in her book, I don't think she brought it up today, was you know, if you look around the world at surveys of happiness, the happiest countries are ones where, uh, where things are more equal. And um, that is true. I, you know, you look at things like there's something called the World Happiness Report, it's great fun. Um, uh, oh, by the way, I put in a regression here because I know this is a seminar and there are economists here and you can't have a seminar with economists without a regression somewhere. So I made sure to bring one in. Um, so if you look at the correlation between happiness and inequality as measured, say, by a Gini coefficient, yeah, it's true that uh, uh, higher Gini coefficient reduces happiness. So if it's more unequal, people are less happy. But it's much more true that if income is higher, people are happier, that the correlation with income measures like GDP per capita are, uh, so the correlation coefficient, this symbol correlation coefficient is about double. Uh, it's just, it's more strongly correlated with, with income. So I would say people may care more about how much they have rather than how much somebody else has. Uh, and so I would take the focus off inequality. Um, this is another picture, kind of a different angle on that same point. This is a scatter plot of countries of inequality by country um, as measured by the Gini coefficient for income. This folks in on income, not wealth, admittedly. Um, and then income along the horizontal act axis of uh, GDP per capita in thousands of US dollars. Uh, so, so from here, it's like Mexico, it's bad to be Mexico because they're up there in the top left and incomes are low and, and inequality is high. Um, it's good to be Norway over there on the right because uh, you know, income's pretty high and it's pretty equally distributed. That's unambiguous. It gets a little more ambiguous though when you compare like the ones that are in red circles here, um, Greece and Great Britain. So in Britain, Incomes are higher, but less equally distributed. In Greece, it's more equally distributed, but incomes are lower on average. Um, which is better? I think it's, it's ambiguous at best. And um, I'm not sure that the Greeks wouldn't be willing to trade places on this chart with the Brits. Um, so again, to my point that, that you know, the level of income is really what maybe what people care about and because and it, it's what they live off of. And that would be true for the level of wealth as, as well, although I actually think income is probably more important. Um, I have another chart. I think I'm going to skip over this one in the interest of time. I was looking at it at the state level within the US, um, poverty rates versus inequality. Um, although maybe just to make the point here that if we are going to focus on inequality, we should be specific about how we're going to measure it. And maybe national aggregates are not the right focus. And we need to have a richer, um, less aggregate measures of, of inequality uh, if we really wanna focus on that. Let me instead skip to my, my last point, which was about what's the solution to this. Um, this is the chart. Um, that, well, let me, let me say, I think part of the suggestion is that a solution to help low and moderate income households build wealth, wealth would be to make it possible for them to have easy access to bank accounts where they can earn a positive real interest rate, um, a, ideally a substantial one to build wealth. I don't think that's a realistic policy option. And, and this chart helps illustrate why. This is a, a graph that spans 1948 to the present. 
Um, it shows the uh, shows how important banks are in the provision of credit in the U.S. So it's bank credit as a share of total uh, non-financial credit in the economy. And what it shows is that by the mid to late 1970s, banks were 55% of the total, but that was the peak. And since then, the role played by banks has diminished pretty continuously down to about a third of, of credit now. Um, and this reflects a fundamental shift in the role played by banks in the US financial system. And it is it's true in some other countries as well, but it's particularly true here in the US. Banks just don't matter as much anymore. And I personally, I don't believe that they're coming back to the role that they played 40 or 50 years ago. This trend isn't, in my view, due to regulations. Supplemental leverage ratio didn't cause this. Uh, it wasn't low rates because rates weren't low during this whole time. Uh, it's not high capital requirements because capital requirements weren't high this whole time. I think it's pretty easy to to see that a lot of this is driven by developments in information technology and financial technology that went a long way to eliminating or reducing or changing a lot of the factors that have always been seen as the role that, as what it is that makes banks special in the economy. Um, whether it's diversification or it's addressing information problems or even role in the payment system, we're just no longer so bank dependent. And I don't see this reversing and I don't see it as a bad thing. So, it, and it does imply that any proposals that uh, rely on returning to a 1970s style banking where banks are the ones making loans and people build wealth by putting their savings in, in bank accounts at 5% interest, I just don't think there are any regulatory tweaks that are gonna give it, get us back there and make that happen. So, as I said, tried to be provocative. Let me wrap up um, the three main points. I think recent monetary policy has uh, had some unintended consequences. I think it's brought us to a dangerous spot. I'm not as convinced that inequality is the real problem. I think it's poverty, and I think we should address that. And I don't think that going back to the old days of banking is going to be part of the solution. Sunil? Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Mark, uh, for your comments. Um, um, the next uh, discussant is Bill Nelson. Bill, the floor is yours. All right. So um, Sunil, Karen, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to, to talk uh, to this group and to uh, address Karen's work. Um, I've gotten to know Karen since I left the Fed through uh, a lot of interactions, occasional meetings, occasional lunches. I should say lunches, which with whatever clone of Karen was sent out to do it at that time, because there's simply no way that just one uh, Karen Petro could accomplish what, she's, what she accomplishes. She's a trusted source. Uh, of the press on a wide range of financial issues, including the Fed. Um, she's an influential thinker and author uh, as what brings us here today. And as a person at uh, the Bank Policy Institute, one of the people responsible for keeping track of what's going on out there, uh, I say with some humility that half the time a speech or a new document or a policy document or research comes up that is relevant to our work, uh, we learn of it because of email from Karen. So, so thanks, Karen. Um, with that prologue, though, it's uh, with some reluctance that I, I want to say that my uh, uh, that I disagree with um, Karen's sort of key thesis that the Federal Reserve's monetary policy is on net a contributor to economic inequality, although I agree with a lot of what she says. So let me explain. So uh, first, uh, how does monetary policy work? So traditional way, uh, the Fed lowers overnight interest rates, which increases aggregate demand which lowers the unemployment rate, uh, which raises the inflation rate. Uh, the the non-traditional way through QE or large scale asset purchases, the Fed lowers the interest rate, which increases aggregate demand, which lowers the unemployment rate, which raises the inflation rate and vice versa. It's the same, the same mechanism. Uh, LSAPs reduce longer term interest rates by taking longer term securities out of public hands pushing up their price, it's just supply and demand, and reducing term premiums. Uh, the, the Fed simply is not buying assets in order to create reserves and inject liquidity into banks uh, in the hopes that banks will lend more. In fact, if anything, uh, that creation of reserves reduces lending uh, because, uh, capital, because of capital requirements, banks have to hold the reserves and it, and it crowds out lending. Um, 
So how to lower interest rates stimulate the economy? I'm pretty old fashioned about this. Um, and uh, you know, I say it's through the interest rate channel. If interest rates are lower, the return to saving is lower. So households elect to consume now rather than later. The cost of borrowing is low, uh, to invest is lower. So businesses and households increase investment. And I mean, in investment in plant and equipment and refrigerators and in cars. Now there's also a wealth effect. Uh, that's really just a manifestation of the interest rate channel. Equity prices go up, including households 401ks and mutual funds. House prices go up, people are wealthier, so they consume more, especially the middle class. Because as Karen's pointed out, the wealthy don't really consume that much more when their wealth goes up. It's not that sensitive. Uh, and there's an exchange rate channel. The dollar weakens, so it's cheaper to buy domestic goods than foreign goods, boosting GDP. That's an important channel as well. So who benefits from all this? Well, I was taught by Jim Tobin that when I was uh, in graduate school that the most important focus of monetary policy should be unemployment uh, because unemployment is devastating for the unemployed and their family. Uh, and I agree with that. Uh, lower interest rates reduce the amount of unemployment. That's the objective. Now, somewhat less important borrowers benefit from lower interest rates. Borrowers benefit from higher inflation, which reduces their debt load. Bar homeowners benefit from higher home prices and lower mortgage rates. And owners of financial assets, especially equity, get wealthier. And that does increase wealth inequality. But what's the alternative? If the FOMC had not cut interest rates in March 2020 and not purchased assets, the ensuing depression would have reduced wealth inequality, but at the expense of unemployment rising further from 15%. We were thinking maybe 25%. That does not seem like a good solution uh, for the underprivileged. Now, it's not actually clear to me precisely what Karen has in mind in her book. Uh, now she discusses helicopter money, but it's not clear to me if she's actually a fan. So uh, Ben Bernanke wrote a very clear uh, and, and great blog for uh, Brookings in 2016, describing helicopter money and how it can work. And he says basically that the Fed, that the government could uh, cut taxes and, and increase spending and issue debt to finance that, and the Fed could buy that debt um, and, and promise not to sell it. Uh, and I'll say Vice Chair Quarles, former Vice Chair Quarles, said something similar in 2020, explaining what they were doing, and said the Fed may need to keep buying treasuries for some time, uh, basically given the, the, the huge amount of debt outstanding, which seems pretty similar. I, I don't think this is what she, Karen has in mind. Uh, but in the paper that she released in advance of this conference, uh, her summary had a lot that resonated with me. Uh, rapid policy normalization combined with a regulatory rewrite. Uh, and I don't just think that she just means rapid policy normalization right now, but rapid, but a bias towards rapid policy uh, normalization uh, whenever the Fed uh, enters into a period of extraordinarily stimulative uh, uh, monetary policy. So in economic models, it's the level, not the change in monetary policy that stimulates or restrains the economy. So it makes no sense in these models to say, keep your powder dry or refraining to cut rates so you have room to cut later or selling assets so that you can buy them again. There's really no bias towards uh, equilibrium. Uh, but if longer term uh, periods of easy policy are socially costly, and perhaps because they reduce financial stability, maybe central banks should adopt a bias towards normalizing policy. This is an idea that Claudio Borio, uh, the co-head of research at the Bank for International Settlements has been arguing for a while, and most recently in the speech that I cite here. Uh, and I think Karen is really onto something. I think she has a very, uh, it's a very, it's a point that we should all be thinking about. Now, I've got to say the regulatory rewrite part uh, also resonated with me quite a bit, perhaps partly because of uh, something we think about a lot at the Bank Policy Institute. Although, to be fair, it's something that I thought I started thinking about uh, a couple of years before leaving the Fed and as one of the people helping to design stress tests uh, is very concerned about the impact of stress tests on inequality. And that's basically because the stress, so first, first regulatory rewrite proposal, bank stress tests are stressful Become, are, make them, are made stressful by assuming an, in a, a very extremely severe recession. Uh, and they have to assume a very, very implausibly severe recession because bank losses come from a variety of sources, but the Fed has only one dial to turn to make the losses sort of match historical experience. So they turn that dial up to 11. 
Well, loans to small businesses and LMI households do very poorly in a very severe recession. So that that builds in a bias against lending to those folks. And my colleague at uh, BPI, Francisco Covas, has written extensively on this. And I, I cite many of his papers there documenting empirically this effect. Now, another part of stress tests is that they tend to reduce lending to subprime people in a household because they, uh, that they assume bank balance sheets remain constant. But banks actually reduce lending in a recession. Uh, to subprime households. So the stress test design biases up expected losses on those loans, and that creates an incentive for banks to not make those loans. And the, the Harvard-based Committee on Capital Markets Regulation in this, earlier this year wrote a paper uh, describing this effect. Now, what are the solutions? Well, it's not that the stress test should be made easier, but rather that they should be based on averages of multiple scenarios uh, and on a realistic path to bank balance sheet. So here's some other ideas, uh, other ways that regulation bias uh, against um, uh, that hurt lend inequality. So uh, the banks need to be allowed to use AI and, and machine learning in their credit underwriting. There's the banking agencies have a very strong bias against uh, underwriting models that can't be um, the, you know, completely understood. But banks, that means banks have to rely on FICO scores and FICO scores uh, really depend on having a borrowing history. So it's a very hard mechanism for the low and middle, middle income people uh, to, to succeed with. Uh, whereas there's lots of evidence showing that uh, machine learning and AI uh, find people uh, that maybe don't do well with FICO scores, but that are good credit risks. So on this paper, you can see uh, a note by, by Greg Baer and uh, Neha Prakash at the Bank Policy Institute that I cite uh, in the reference list. Uh, so, um, uh, another issue is that uh, banks, uh, you know, actively are making small short-term loans with the intention of helping people build up credit histories, but 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 just because of the mechanics of it, if there's just a, even a modest fee on those loans, that shows up as a very high APR, uh, and so you have to be smart about any APR limits. And my my colleague Paul Calum uh, uh, put out a, a note that describes this. Uh, very clearly, um, and that's also in the reference list. So um, in addition, um, you know, uh, many banks are engaged in the Bank On Initiative, which is a program run by the nonprofit cities for the Financial Endowment Fund, which uh, offers, it, which is an effort to bring in the unbanked uh, into the banking system. It offers um, uh, no overdraft, low fee, no minimum balance uh, accounts. Uh, at, for those folks. But banks need more, greater clarity that they can count uh, the provision of those accounts towards their community as a Community and Reinvestment Act credit. So on my part, uh, I, I have a, a, a proposal as well. So just like the Federal Reserve has a standing regular lending program for agricultural banks to support their seasonal lending. This is actually the most, by far and away, the most used discount window program. Uh, they could have a similar program that would support uh, banks in LMI communities, banks that were community development financial institutions for their lending to LMI communities. And I described this in a note uh, that I posted, uh, that I published last year, uh, how to design a Fed credit facility to support LMI communities. Uh, so in particular, the Fed could offer slightly subsidized credit. Uh, they offered subsidized credit to commercial banks for decades, so it's certainly not a problem to do so. Um, to, uh, to CDFIs that are depository institutions in an amount no more than their, their lending to LMI borrowers, communities, small businesses, um, and, and similar loans. The loans would be perfectly safe uh, they'd be backed by the same collateral as all discount window loans are, are backed by. Uh, and the cost would be modest for taxpayers because it would just be a slight subsidization. But the payoff could be very large, even though the program itself wouldn't be that large. Uh, by supporting, by j even just the Fed taking an action to support, uh, to reduce, to help fight inequality. And this is a monetary policy tool. So through this tool. Thank you. Well, I should say all of these remarks are available on BPI's uh, webpage if you'd like to see uh, the remarks and the references that I've made. Thanks very much, uh, Bill. That, that, was, that was very good. And um, can I um, hand the floor over to, to Peter? 
Thanks very much to uh, Jay and Sunil for the invitation to speak on this terrific topic and for Karen for org uh, being the intellectual force behind it. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I want to take a slightly different tack. I'm a financial historian and I want to think about the financial history and political history of central banking in the United States across the 20th century. And why I regard Karen's efforts and those of her fellow travelers as being a remarkable departure from what had been long-term stable political coalitions around central banking. Now, when you think of musicals written about historical contexts, about the meaning of money, the first you'll probably consider would be Hamilton, the musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Now, I will humbly submit as the father of four young children and having now watched Encanto 25 times, that uh, Miranda's Encanto is the far superior musical and artistic production. But of course, the fact of Hamilton's great success points to uh, an appetite for understanding those political contexts between Hamiltonian visions of finance and Jeffersonian alternatives. But it's The Wizard of Oz that's the real musical that gets at the heart of monetary politics. As Hugh Rockoff famously argued, The Wizard of Oz is a monetary allegory, was intended as a monetary allegory at the time about how humble Kansas farmers can avoid the beguiling effects of the moneyed Emerald City, but not through their false promises of magical outcomes, but at the end of a uh, error-ridden gold-bricked gold standard road uh, that culminates in fact in the bimetallic ringing of silver slippered initiatives. Recall, of course, that it was MGM, not Frank Baum, who made those slippers, slippers ruby. The politics of 1896, which is, of course, what Wizard of, The Wizard of Oz is about, that pitted the Republican hard money William McKinley against the great commoner William Jennings Bryan set the stage for an important political divide that characterized the way that Americans fought about mon monetary politics for over a century. And in that divide, we see Republicans as proponents for hard money, which at the time meant the gold standard, and Democrats on the side of something more. Initially, this meant greater accommodation for farmers through bimetallism, the expansion of the monetary base to silver. I'm going to remind you of that famous part of, 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 a, of a quote, less often quoted from the famous uh, speech by Brian, the cross of gold speech. He says, you come to us and tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. I tell you that the great cities rest upon these broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. While the contours of those coalitions shifted over time, the democratic coalition became of course much less agrarian and rural by mid 20th century. Uh, there was still a growing view even then that monetary politics had a decidedly partisan flavor, led by Wright Patman in the mid-century, uh, who eventually became dean of the House of Representatives, the longest serving Democratic congressman. Their focus was still on these conventional stories. It was a kind of Bryanism, even though the gold standard uh, by that point had become a memory. Uh, there in the mid-century, we there was also a growing intellectual ferment around the idea that monetary policy had an important role to play around the concept of both uh, economic accommodation and inflation. This was not so in the 50s and 60s, at least not so prominently so. And by the 1980s, uh, though we now regard Paul Volcker as a technocratic hero, a platonic ideal of a central banker, and government servant. That status was far from secure. Democrat though he was, he was a Democrat of a different type by prioritizing price stability over economic accommodation, triggering a major recession uh, in, uh, in the early 1980s through the FOMC's uh, monetarist policies. We saw something of a peace for our time declared on monetary politics. The rise of the technocratic central banker meant to lean against the winds of inflation uh, was created in those important years. Now that still, even so, during Volcker's time, there were efforts to impeach him. There were 
labor unions that fought him. And even when he resigned in triumph uh, at, in 1987, there were pockets of partisanship on the Democratic left that regarded his preference for fighting inflation as inconsistent with the values uh, of the country. Now, the 2008 crisis and the Tea Party that reacted to it reinforced these political divides, even as it scrambled the certainty that those partisan divides would fall also along divides of technocratic expertise and populist enthusiasms. The Republican reaction to 2008 uh, was in, in a monetary perspective was both populist, but also consistent with that old Bryanist approach. This was the hard money, hard money populist on the right, so the partisan inflections remained uh, there, uh, the, the articulation of them as a more of a populist argument was what shifted. And this is most infamous perhaps when Rick Perry, the presidential candidate in 2012, made some quite menacing statements about what would happen to Ben Bernanke should he ever come to Texas. And then this canned history should convince you of an important fact. And that is that the Fed, or that the Fed is rarely fond of admitting in fact, we'll deny it if asked. And that is that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is a deeply political institution. It's a political institution embedded within a political system. And it's more than that. It's vaunted independence is not a vacuum seal. What's more is it's a very successful political institution. Now, what's remarkable to me about this fact uh, is not uh, or about is not this fact of the Fed's success at politics but that it, success in politics is in part a function of its navigation through these stable coalitions, the challenges that have arisen notwithstanding. But 2020 has changed this in an important way. And what I see in Karen's book is what I would call the rise of the hawkish left. And here I'm borrowing metaphors that come to us from the War of 1812 through the Vietnam War, which is the idea that hawks are conservatives who in the monetary context would favor hard policy in the name of price stability, where doves are more liberal and in the partisan inflection more democratic and would weigh their uncertainties in favor of economic accommodation. And what Karen's book and uh, her fellow travelers are articulating is a critique in favor of less economic accommodation for purposes that aren't specifically about inflation, although in today's presentation, we saw a little bit more of that, but instead are about what happens when the Fed is accommodating the economy and doing, th and doing things that in the, hawk the words of the hawkish left are making things worse for the least well off. And this strikes me as new. There have been of course, Democrats who favored hard money in the past. Grover Cleveland is a great example of that. Uh, Paul Douglas, a, a lion of the left, uh, was awfully hard on the uh, on uh, the Truman administration for inflationary policies. But the rise of the hawkish left after 2020 has a lot of new flavor in it. And I think it's a cleavage of old time uh, monetary political coalitions that will be extraordinarily important in the years to come. Uh, and the reason for this importance uh, have uh, largely to do with the ways that the Fed secures itself from partisan meddling through political successes against a backdrop of fairly consistent coalitions. Now, if those, the assumption of the consistency of those coalitions is wrong, then that's going to be a new challenge for the Fed. Let me conclude with two comments about why I think the hawkish left has not yet made its case. Now, Karen goes to great lengths in her book and in, the, uh, and in her article today and in her presentation to say it's not merely correlation, it's causation, but other than placing underlines and exclamation points against the causal claims, I don't see it. I see instead a, an emphatic insistence that both of these things happened at the same time, unconventional monetary experimentation and rising chasms of inequality. Um, but these correlations are so complex that the causal story is insufficiently told. The second I think is more important, and that is that we have to account for the counterfactual. And if in Karen's preferred policy outcome, we jacked up interest rates uh, and discontinued unconventional monetary policy, my question goes back to what happens to those cities and those prairies, that allegory from the Wizard of Oz. And there I see that the outcomes uh, for the least well off 
would be much harder and harsher than I think the hawkish left and left anticipates. And I'll stop there. Peter, thanks very much for that uh, wonderful historical perspective. Um, uh, let me start with um, offering the floor to Karen. Karen, uh, you've had three um, great discussions um, react to your comments and, and your book. Um, you have the floor. I don't even know where to start because the comments were, were so uh, interesting, different and, and profound and I thank you all for them. I think to Mark, I would just comment, I, I think on those very interesting graphs and um, discussion of inequality versus income, it, I think it's important to, to think about um, how happiness correlates with income when it's shared and what your income measures are, which are, there's, a, there's, I think, a great deal of uh, spirit, perhaps spurious correlation. And in terms of the idea, you know, certainly I don't know, I'm neither I nor anyone I know who in part of, thank you, Peter, the hawkish left says we need, you know, a, a, everybody must be the same. Um, it, the United States has always had an unequal economy, um, with, but we had a middle class. And I think the really important point, and this gets into several of the uh, causal causation and uh, as well as correlation points, Peter, is we don't anymore. Yes, there's a middle in the chart in terms of income and wealth. But when you look beneath even where the, the middle 40%, you see tremendous loss of long-term security. You know, in the United States, in 1975, we had an unequal economy. We had a 1% and 100%, but output was shared dollar for dollar. If you, if you earned $100, you got $100 on quote of output. If you earned 10, you got 10. Now, in 2018, the last year of these data, the top 1% output share is 312% of what it was in 1975. The bottom 50 gets nothing. They work in a sense for no return. And this changes the structure in, in ways that I think are important to, to think through. Uh, in terms of Bill, I, I, I think on your arguments, I would say in terms of how monetary policy transmits in terms of issues like aggregate demand and some of those, yeah, but a lot of it didn't happen. Um, there was a lot going on starting in 2010 uh, in terms of you know, we're not looking at companies making enormous investments as, as monetary policy would, would suggest. Instead, we're looking at companies sitting on enormous cash stockpiles and capital formation uh, at way behind where you would ever have expected to. Something isn't working. And I really do believe that one of the things that isn't working as the economic uh, impact of the very different ways Americans consume and financial markets work that are driven um, in part by Fed policy, which gets to the causation correlation question. Uh, I, I'm actually really pleased to be considered the hawkish left. And it's really fascinating to me is after my book came out and it got a, a fair amount of public reaction. Um, I just was happened to be invited and I gave my first speech on the book um, right after it came out from the Cato Institution, which is a libertarian, rather conservative group. And so everybody said I was a real, I was an arch conservative. I was a, I was a tool of the banks. I didn't even want to talk about some of the Twitter traffic. And then I did some very liberal podcasts and everybody, it, um, it was, uh, you know, some, again, you look at the Twitter traffic, which you really shouldn't do when it's about yourself. Uh, and, you know, and the name calling just flips um, because we are so polarized now. So it, it, I appreciate Peter trying to recognize that I, 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 I hope I have fellow travelers. I, it, it's, it's a somewhat of a worrisome term, but that there are folks out there thinking about how do we generate shared prosperity, not just market return? I don't think it's a choice between cities and prairies. I think you're counterfactual. I would not call, never did call for rapid normalization in my book. And sorry, it's not clear, you know, you know, 
no, you know, after the crisis, boom, pull, pull all the plugs, let's not wait for recovery, you know, let's let the crisis ramp the same thing in 2020, I think, to Bill, your point. I fully recognize the need for financial stability as a cornerstone of economic security, which is vital to shared prosperity, but I really question how it was delivered. I go back, I know it's somewhat archetypal, why junk ETFs? Why did the Fed support the market with such enthusiasm and had to get dragged by Congress kicking and screaming into supporting mid-sized business and municipalities. The Fed's approach to where economic activity should reside, not just does, which I think it's mistaken by, but should, I think warrants very close scrutiny. And if it takes the hawkish left to do it, then I hope I find some fellow travelers. Thank you both. Thank you all three. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions um, that I'd like to pose to all of you. So I, 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 I've been thinking about the justification for QE. Now, I think that after 2008, um, you know, QE1, QE2 um, justified. But starting in 2012, end of 2012, QE3, and an extended use of monetary policy since then for six or seven years. The question is, and I think this is being raised by a lot of people, what did it accomplish? Um, it, it, clearly, as Karen has pointed out, there was, um, we were, inflation targets were missed. Lots of monetary accommodation, inflation targets not uh, 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 attained. Inflation only takes off after pandemic disruption. So the question is in that, period, what exactly did QE3, um, and we won't talk about QE4 because those were again exceptional circumstances, but again, Karen's reaction is right. What did we achieve by QE3 in, in that six, seven year period with extensive monetary accommodation? I think I would add, just quite quickly add financial instability to that because I think, you know, there was time wasn't uh, allowed to permit. We also had the big repo market crisis in 2019. You know, in terms of all of a sudden, the even with all this accommodation, liquidity disappeared. And is that all because of the SLR? No, there's a lot going on here. And I think, Bill, I, I would turn to you because Sunil's asked an important question. But looking across, I agree that decade, a lot of things the Fed never thought were going to happen happened. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and yes, I mean, so um, I think that QE3, the flow-based asset purchase program, both the one, uh, uh, the QE3 and QE4, indeed, the one that was just completed. Uh, but, but let's talk about QE3. So, you know, I think its intention, its objective was to have a, you know, uh, anything it takes, everything it takes moment uh, for the for the FOMC to to show the kind of commitment of that those remarks by, um, um, I can't remember, the, the ECB uh, chief. Mario Draghi. Uh, Mario Draghi, um, mm -hmm. is everything uh, it takes comment. But, but, but it, it was simply, unfortunately, uh, something that went on way too long. It was very difficult once the Fed started uh, for the Fed to stop. And if you go back and as I've written, uh, if you look at the, uh, the released policy documents at the time, they thought, uh, or a lot of the participants thought they were getting into a $500 billion program, even though it was pretty clear that what they were getting into was a $1.3 trillion program as they ended up doing. Um, and I, I see that as sort of just the, the first step leading the path to stick with the floor-based system, and which I, I see as the reason why they've ended up much too large and much too involved in the financial system. Uh, so uh, I think it was unfortunate, but it, its objective was to stimulate the economy, to get to, 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 to escape from continued risk of a deflationary spiral. So, so, so let me, uh, uh, just, just again, a question. So are you saying that in some sense, Tom Honig was right when he said that this was a slippery slope and that if we went down it, that it would lead to all kinds of distortions and, and given the rise in leverage that we've seen across uh, governments, households, and, and corporations, it would be not easy to get out of um, uh, uh, this kind of uh, monetary accommodation. So 
is that is that what you're saying that all kinds of distortions were created now we have a lot of leverage a uh, um, lot of uh, network externalities as we start to pull out um, of this monetary accommodation so i, I just want uh, i'm sorry go ahead um I just released, I published a note. Uh, um, I've, I've written a lot on this precise point. I published another note about a week ago on our website said the, the Fed is stuck on the floor and how can we help it get up? Um, basically, I think that there's an endogenous process through which the Fed provides liquidity. People get used to that liquidity. Examiners get used to that liquidity. That makes that the baseline. The Fed is determined to maintain a buffer over and above the structural demand. So that structural demand grows further they have to create a new buffer to get over and above. And if you look at the Fed's forecasts of how much liquidity they would have to provide to create a floor-based system, look in the 2016 transcripts that were just released uh, a week or two ago. Uh, Janet Yellen and, and um, Bill Dudley both said, well, they think about a trillion dollars in reserve balances would be sufficient to, to meet structural demand plus a buffer and now the Fed's number, at least in 20, at the end of 2019, was 1.8 trillion. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens going forward, whether it's grown further now that the Fed has been providing over $4 trillion in reserve balances. Uh, so I, I think it also happens through the Fed's supervisory process um, that, uh, that, that, again, supervisors get used to um, uh, increased liquidity, and therefore the Fed ends up having to provide that. Uh, so I, I just think that that's a a pernicious dynamic that I think the Fed can get out of if it gradually shrinks its balance sheet, but doesn't forget that when it does so, once it encounters uh, a, a slight resistance, it needs to control giant swings uh, in those reserve balances. So it was on the right path in September 2019, but somehow it forgot uh, that for it, what it did for decades, that once some scarcity shows up, it, it, it can't allow $200 billion or whatever, $100 billion uh, swings in reserve balances in a day. Uh, it needs to control that. But if it does that, I think it can get much smaller than it is now. Karen, Mark, Peter. I agree with Bill. So I, I'll let Mark or Peter descend. Yeah, nothing to add there. Yeah, and I, I think I would just emphasize the point. I, I mean, Bill put it really well that, but that it's it's hard to unwind. The Fed started down this path, and it's really hard once they're on the path to get off of it. Um, and I think that was, I actually think that was evident from the very beginning of QE. Um, I mean, at that time, I was, I still at the Fed, no, I was at the OCC then, and, um, but still, you know, I was able to talk to people at the Fed and never had the sense that there was a real exit strategy once QE started. So, um, that's, I think that's been unfortunate. I would also say though that uh, to amp, uh, I think Peter said something about it's hard to know the counterfactual. And uh, I know people could always say, well, you think it's, if you think it's bad, what would they were in a bad place now? Imagine how bad it would have been if we hadn't had QE. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me try and push that a, a little bit, Mark, what you just say. Um, this is to do the question, the balance between um, monetary, fiscal, and structural policies. Right. I mean, it, monetary policy has limits. And, and, and the question is, what we're trying to talk about is, was there an excessive use of monetary policy because fiscal policy was not available um, and monetary policy became the only uh, game in town. And the only way we can think about that is through counterfactuals, that instead of um, going down the QE route in 2013, had there been a major infrastructure push, or if the helicopter drop had been used to put money directly into bank accounts, yes, possibly with targeted by income and needs, um, would that have led to a different outcome um, a la inequality and, 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 and the politics? No, this, this is sort of the balance between fiscal and monetary policy. And then and, uh, the, the question is, was too much monetary accommodation used relative to fiscal policy. And then we naturally get into the politics that Peter talks about. I can respond to that. Uh, I hear an echo, so I'm gonna exercise my privileges and mute people. <laughs> um, so 
I think that it's in an important sense to understand the politics here. I mean, the, the Speaker of the House during the 1896 election uh, was, uh, was Thomas Brackett Reed. And he's famous for a few reasons, but one is this axiom. One of the greatest delusions in the world is the hope that the evils of the world can be cured by legislation. And the political response to quantitative easing has struck me, uh, quantitative easing, frankly, as a category of, of complaint rather than a specific technical critique strikes me as pretty consistent with this. So people who have seen oh, the Fed is doing much, there is much that I do not like, and I'm going to correlate that word much with a causal direction. And so quantitative easing is evil. It's causing gas to spike or it's causing this or it's causing that. I'm not saying that that's Karen's critique, which is quite sophisticated. But I am saying that the political reactions in 2012 and again more recently have an awful lot of that sort of content in it. And it creates this sense that, uh, and the great risk I see to the hawkish left, uh, and I'm delighted that Karen did not feel uh, that I was name, uh, calling names or anything, because I'm certainly not. I think I am trying to diagnose a, a, a change in the political economy. But the hawkish left runs the risk in building a coalition of change of falling into Reed's delusion, but shifting institutions. And I think that it can be true. One of the greatest delusions in the world is the hope that if the Fed does this, all the evils of the world will be cured. And I don't think the Fed's that powerful. And I think that creating this sense that all evil flows from Fed experimentation uh, runs, uh, runs a pretty profound risk of not only uh, being incorrect, but destabilizing political institutions around the things that the Fed might well be uh, very well positioned to do. And I think those risks are, are high. Something sophisticated is in my book and in my talk and in my thinking, I really try very hard never to say if X, then all will be cured. What I'm trying to say is if X, some of the problems will be, if not cured, certainly remedied, me meaningfully remedied. And given how acute the problem is, something is better than nothing. And that's my argument. So, so I think we, we all agree that given the shocks we faced in 2008 and, and even before and then come pandemic, we've ended up in a place that no one wants to start from. That's for sure, right? We've got inflationary pressures. We've got um, financial fragility, a highly leveraged system. It's more riskier. We've got inequality. However, it came about, it could have been for structural reasons. Um, and we've got political divisiveness. So the question is going forward, um, what role should central banks play? Because that, I mean, I'm not even mentioning the climate crisis. I'm just saying that this is, the, the state of the union, so to speak. This is out there. Uh, we can't, those are the facts. What do we do going forward? As I said, I like to try to explore the idea, sorry, there is a lot of echo, um, of new instruments for monetary policy, because I do think the transmission channels bills described are not working as they should, and the Fed's political uh, uh, construct, which Peter's described so, so very well, uh, insulated from uh, the kinds of thinking that has have to go on. Um, it, it certainly needs better data. And I think that would include, that would significantly improve monetary policy transmission to the extent it still functions through the, the, um, the interest rate corridor. But I, I think the economy is now very structurally different and the Fed's role in that, not helicopter money, but a, I think it needs to understand that the, the wealth effect didn't trickle down, it stayed stuck, it stayed up, it did not support output, it didn't support productivity, and it hasn't supported prosperity. And therefore, new ways of Fed intervention, insulating it from 
quarter over a quarter, who's winning, who's losing in Congress, why I like the idea of automatic stabilizers, I, I, I think may well be part of the solution. But I do think we, we, need, we need to think a lot differently than we have before because the system is different and the old models have not proven resilient or in fact even effectual. So Sunil, uh, let me add, um, I actually think that there's um, a lot of reason to to be optimistic about um, regular old monetary policy in the sense that in the mid tens, um, I think that you know the Fed was delighted uh, to finally see that uh, that their continued stimulus was finally resulting in unemployment that was so low that you were beginning to see wage growth at the lowest levels. Uh, and this was this was some this was something that the Fed was very happy about, uh, and there was an important paper written. I think it was by Dave Wilcox and Dave Reifschneider, uh, arguing that the the traditional model of a separation between aggregate supply and aggregate demand just isn't probably right. The evidence isn't there that when the when aggregate demand uh, grows and grows rapidly and you get down to those levels, you actually bring in aggregate supply as well. Uh, and, and this was, I think, a, a, a lesson that the Fed learned. I think that there was a, a, some regret about tightening in 2016 through 2018 uh, out of concern that inflation would rise without having seen it. And you see a lot of that in Jay Powell's remarks and in the new framework that they announced about you know, wanting to see inflation before they tightened uh, and being, you know, and not focusing on uh, you know these these optimal control uh, rules that that penalize higher and unemployment, but but really letting the Phillips curve work for them and and pushing the unemployment rate down as far as they could, uh, and waiting for that 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 inflation to show up. Now, unfortunately, uh, that may be one of the potential maybe one of the the sort of the many factors that has seems to have contributed to them ending up possibly behind the curve right now. But nevertheless, uh, I think that they were, they were, they're down the right, they, I think that this is a good path for them to be on uh, for monetary policy to help uh, this idea that let's make sure the unemployment rate gets down as low as it possibly can and, and, and see uh, wage growth uh, for, for the lower sectors of the economy. I uh, can add too, and I think this is uh, an important point that sometimes the Fed is criticized for being subject too much to groupthink, that there's a club, the club consists of its members, and its members all see the world in the same way. And I think historically, that's a pretty good critique. I don't know how much it attaches to the uh, current central banking climate. I recall in 2014 or 15, there were many on uh, Capitol Hill who were furious that uh, Chair Yellen wanted to make the connections between monetary policy and inequality a topic of investigation. They felt that that was wholly inappropriate for a central banker to do. They probably did not know that Alan Greenspan uh, spoke in 1998 for the theme of the Kansas of the Jackson Hole Symposium, which was inequality, right? And so the Fed has been paying attention to these things. And I can tell you from, uh, you know, I'm no Fed insider. I've never worked a day in my life for the Federal Reserve. Um, but it would be astonishing to me in, uh, to predict in 2023 20, and beyond the Fed not continuing to make these sorts of connections a pretty consuming part of the way they think about it. But I would also advise them uh, to make sure that they are thinking about the counterfactuals and having more than a mental model in place to say, all right, if you own the assets and the assets are the instrument for monetary policy, then you're gonna be a beneficiary uh, of uh, the, that instrumentation. I think that's really important and true, but the alternatives, and I think the implications of Karen's critique are rather astonishing to me, to throw out that entire working system to monetize other assets or place the Fed, I don't see monetary stabilizers accomplishing anything like this. It would turn instead the Federal Reserve to be uh, kind of a, a, an investment portfolio uh, that is meant to, to provide something that we point to Congress to do. So there, I think when Powell says it's fiscal policy's responsibility, he's actually making a more nuanced argument, which is to say the very operating system of central banks as they sit atop financial intermediation uh, prevents it from doing some of the things that could remedy income inequality 
And that, that is a very good thing. And so I would, uh, I'll leave that there. Okay, we just have time, Mark, if you have a last comment. Just and I'll very it. quickly, can I just say what Peter was just saying was part of what I was trying to say in my remarks. And then second, uh, to say that the Fed, I think, is aware of the relationship between monetary policy and inequality, more so than it might appear from some public comments. And I would point people to an interesting symposium the New York Fed put on recently, where it was a discussion of, in part of how inequality affects transmission, but also of how monetary and fiscal policy affect inequality. And you know, you'll see John Williams, the president of the Sam, of the uh, New York Fed, sitting there through those sessions and participating. And I think that's a sign of how seriously the Fed takes this stuff. Thanks very much. Um, um, so let me, you know, we've run out of time. So let me just conclude um, to, to, to sum up uh, what we heard. It was a brilliant discussion. Now, given recent experience and 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 given you know what all of you have said, it's it's very hard to. Um, by the idea that central banks in their pursuit of price and financial stability don't have effect on society's other objectives. They do. Now, so it raises, raises a broader question of governance uh, and po politics. So, so complexity of our economic, financial, and political systems um, has, has, has clearly grown quite considerably. So, and what's also happening at the moment as we speak is that information and digital technologies are rewiring our economy and our society. So I think what Karen is saying is that we need to have a better understanding of the emergent system, um, that certain things that we thought were appropriate channels of policy transmission need to be studied or may not be working. Um, we need to redesign institutions and policies maybe accordingly. So, so, so I mean, my sense is that the system is evolving and maybe we need to rethink or at least reassess some of our, our, our shibboleths. And, when you come down to it, and I think agree with Karen's uh, uh, point and including what Peter uh, emphasized uh, on the politics that look, political democracy is meaningless without economic democracy and some modicum of individual agency. And if the bottom half of the household distribution is that precarious, you know, we've just got to give this whole issue a, a, a much harder thinking. But anyway, so, so, so let me say, uh, again, uh, what everyone said, I think Karen's book is great. You should read it. You may not agree with it, but it will it will force you to think. Um, I'd like to add that another book that is, was very thoughtful, I thought, was 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 written by a friend, Peter Deitch, and, and co-authors called "Do Central Banks Serve the People?" You know, Peter is a philosopher, and again, clearly written, forces you to think, um, and 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 you should have a look at them. With that. Um, many thanks, really many thanks for uh, an absolutely superb panel and a great discussion and, and, and all of you who participated. And, and with that, let me say a, a, a good day to everyone. Stay healthy. <laughs>